Okay. Okay. So let's uh, first of all let me introduce the technical committee commitment uh, as part of the open farm governance structure. Uh, the role of the HBC technical committee is to work together with the community to overcome uh, some of the actual HBC bottleneck of open farm. Uh, let's say we uh, we want to improve the uh, the performance just to move to the actual let's say near uh, near pe, pe, pre, pre peta scale up to peta scale and pre extra scale performance at a long period. Uh, one of the most important activities is to propose a recommendation to the steering committee that can move in the direction that we can propose and suggest. Okay, let's have this will be just a very, let's say, um, or the introductive. Uh, there is no no formula, no present, no no result. Just I want to give you a brief overview, and you will see later on in details of all the activity that the uh, uh, the committee is doing. I want to show only this graph, let's say. This is the so-called roof line model. Uh, that's a, a very well-known uh, graph to measure the, the performance of the actual uh, code. On the x-axis, you have, let's say, the computational intensity. On the y-axis, you have the performance in GGraphOp. As you can see, let's say, uh, the, the graph are, are logarithmic both on X and Y scale. As you can see, we you can see how the uh, new HPC system are increasing the performance in the last decades. They are just moving to higher computational intensity and higher GGraph op. And I just put here what was the 10 or 15 years improvement for the Intel family, but uh, you can just extrapolate with the uh, new data still higher, okay? Where we are, we are in the CFD range that is on the lower left part. So simply we are not, let's say, take, exploit the advantage of the HPC. Let's say all the CFD code are mainly memory bounded. So let's say we have a very uh, low peak per flop uh, intensity. We are lower at two order of magnitude by what is the standard because the standard is measured for the impact. The okay, impact is just, uh, you know better than me, on the invention of the big uh, dense matrices. We never do this in our life. We do sparse matrix uh, vector product with a big sparsity and a lot of, let's say, uh, uh, iterative, iterative uh, system to solve. To do this, there is a new system to measure this. But what I want to do is that we have to work very hard to, to increase the, our performances. What we have to do, let's say, um, we, my, my idea is just to put together some of, of the representative from uh, different, let's say, sector. Uh, the, uh, the, these representatives are mixed geographically and also in terms of, let's say, our uh, uh, our uh, role. You can see people from ESI, from uh, uh, academia, from a chip center, from uh, from industry, from a consultant. Uh, there are a lot of people. Uh, let's say that we are. Is very crowded, honestly. But, but it's not to me. But it's due to the fact that HBC is one of the hot, let's say, topic in the in the CFD. And I have the pleasure to, to work with pe the people uh, clever and better than me in these years. And now at least some of them and few of them are here. And you can see the, their work that is going in these, uh, in these days, okay? I cannot uh, say go to the list because I spent five minutes only by reading. So you will see some of them later on, okay? Uh, okay, uh, what do we want to do? We want to make some recommendation to the ceiling committee in respect to the HPC taking area. I just put here the list that just came to my mind when Fred asked me, just put some idea when we can work. Probably this is a, a work for a few decades, probably. I just, I just scratched my mind in two minutes. So let's say you can imagine what is the, the amount of work that has to be done 
to, to make a full usage of HPC. Let's say, of course, I, we cannot work on this as a, as a committee because we can also propose a recommendation. Of course, what we have to do, we have to make some prioritization. So uh, what we are prioritized is some of this activity. Uh, in especially is improving uh, the scalability of linear algebra solver. Uh, and we want to make a, a proper HPC benchmark suite. We want to work on the, the other topic that everyone is talking about, GPU porting, and of course, Parallel.io. This is some activity that in the last three, four years we start, we, we have work and we have some results that I'm going very briefly to, to, get, to show you, okay? Uh, okay, uh, HPC benchmark. Let's say the idea is just to provide a common shared repository with all relevant data set information in order to create guideline and uh, how to run proper benchmark on HPC because the standard benchmark are mean for verification and validation of numerical method and some features. So we want to move on HPC. And this require a lot of activity together with a lot of members to do this. This activity has, let's say, give a birth to the uh, a repo when you can see all the HPC benchmark that we have started to work with. We start to, for example, to work with the 3D, 3D driven cavity when we make the transformation for this HPC benchmark. I remember we started with Simone, Sergei, and Helic started to make the modification. We started with Fabrizio to propose to make this comparison with HPC motorbike and driven. We have uh, this was a really let's say uh, community effort, and now the activity is led by the work package to leader of Exaform, Eric Ruscia, that is going a very, very good work in the HPC Grand Challenge. And now you have a very good list of detailed test cases in terms of description, how to run on HPC, and all these test cases are divided by typology. I just put here a list on some of them. A combustion test cases, a compressible test cases, incompressible test cases, a joint, the 3D even also pinball form. So we have less air cut off and we have a HPC motorbike. I just put here a list of some of the people that are contributing, but uh, I cannot give you the list because it is too long. And I'm really grateful for what has been done and now the people can go over there, pick up the HPC, and they can run the, the code. What it was, from my point of view, missing a few years ago, honestly. If we go ahead, uh, the, first acti the first activity that we started to work with was the scalability of the linear algebra solver. Uh, you know, this was one of the main bottlenecks in not in open form, but all the CFD code when we go to move to performance on, um, on a massive parallel cluster. Oh, the activity started with the library PC4 form when we were able to plug in the PC library into open form and the work, let's say, is now, let's say, I can see it's recognized by the community. Uh, it was also mentioned by Neil this morning, and this was is not me, but it was part of uh, Simon Zambini that is here from the Petsi community, by Simone Ebna, uh, by Mark, where is Mark over here? And uh, let's say this is, let's say, what is very, is very, we have just put together what is uh, put together the effort of the Petsi community that can be used inside open form. Uh, there is a presentation by the uh, chaos uh, group later on regarding this. Other activity on uh, linear algebra, uh, inside the, the work package three, I remember, of the form, there is the, uh, an activity that is going to rewrite, let's say, the data structure open form in a, more, a format that is suitable for HPC. And this is good to give uh, a new, let's say, kernel that is the form. And this presentation is going to be presented later on as well. And this is, let's say, very experimental work. Uh, I, of course, I have to work some other, let's say, 
external plugin uh, by Gregor. I don't know if Gregor is over all in, uh, is here. Uh, okay, yeah, it's uh, the Ginkgo library. Let's say uh, this is uh, the again improving this scalability thanks to use of external linear algebra package software. And this is a presentation that will be uh, later on. Uh, if now we go to what everyone, uh, everyone is working about, uh, GPU porting, enabling open form, maybe I can spend um, a couple of days to work about that. And uh, uh, probably it's not enough. I just uh, summarize here what are the main activities that is doing by different actors of the community. Let's say, uh, of course, now thanks to the PET C4 form, we can, let's say, make use of, of the uh, activity by PET C, for example, the uh, Cocos and Cuspars that are working to make a GPU. And I have to thank Federico Piscaglia. I don't know where it's Federico that is going to the productization of this library. Uh, will be uh, very soon released in the in the main uh, open form uh, library. So you can just plug with this library. Of course, there are some other activity. Federico is also working on offloading of the G chemistry part for the hot flow by GPU. In that case, he, he can just solve the OD part by hot flow by offloading it to GPU. But now we are, we are, there is not only NVIDIA, of course, the, we know there are some other competitors. It, for the moment, is a, there is a big, let's say, competition in the world. And uh, let's say we have to, uh, to take into account all the other competitors. AMD, uh, starting maybe one or two years ago, uh, to a couple of activities regarding the porting on uh, AMD GPUs. One is the e epification of PC. So they are working together with the PC community to port on HIP uh, the, the library to run Navity on AMD. Single activity is just uh, a, is a, an underdevelopment activity uh, where there is no framework uh, duplication. Is it the porting uh, of form with unified memory uh, using a Plugma OpenMP? I just mentioned again PET-C that can be used uh, via, via the external library. Maybe uh, later on, Stefano could give me more update on that. And I want also to mention some activity done by NVIDIA again and now by uh, by Giulio Malenza. I don't know if it is over here. It was, let's say, a building of a, a, a proof of concept, accelerate uh, open form on GPU by using the new ESO GD++ standard 17 that is natively running on GPU. Uh, I, again, uh, we can use the Ginkgo library to make use of the offloading on GPU, and that's something of the activity. Maybe I'm, I'm uh, forgetting something, but there is a huge, a huge effort that the community spread and distributed. This is a pro and con, so let's say let's, that's my my feeling. Of course, I want to mention very briefly the parallel IO and a lot of balance, and that is another big bottleneck for when we move to a parallel uh, uh, HPC cluster. I remember maybe now 10 years ago when I started to make the first industrial test with open form, I just uh, ran out of I, I notes during the night and the class, all the classes go down in Geneca due to the exceed of IO limits. Yeah, yeah, it was me, yeah. And yeah, 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 of course, yeah. It was for a industrial customer, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, for uh, IO system, okay, um, Eric and uh, um, Sergey give a, a very good, uh, let's say, tutorial uh, 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 in pass, I ju can just know what, what there is uh, of the shelf. We have the standard uncollated, standard open form. We have the collocated version that is mainly done by uh, the CFD Direct. And uh, now we have uh, two types of parallel IO. One was the enabling of IOS 2, thanks to Mark and, um, and the, the, the Lawrence Livermore guys, that we can now use the IOS write function uh, to use a parallel IO. And there is the new, let's say, um, revolutionary idea by by Eric, let's say that is going to be developed by 
inside the form that is a totally re rewriting, rethinking of the I.O. in parallel. Of course, uh, I have to mention the load balancing. Now there are some new load balancing uh, library available. I just mentioned here the work done by Erkin Rush, but for sure I'm so forgetting some uh, load balancing library. I remember something from BSC that is uh, uh, around, and for sure uh, Olga and Marshall have done a lot of work in this activity, but I just just mentioned something, something on that. Uh, okay, just to conclude, how much time do you have? Uh, okay, uh, two minutes. Uh, our, let's say, taking a recommendation uh, to the steering committee is uh, regarding the priority number one from our mind, our point of view, is uh, the GPU porting. So uh, we have seen a couple of activities doing it by NVIDIA and let's say uh, for doing the porting with linear algebra with MGX. We have seen some activity doing it by different team, by PC, by Jingo, and uh, these activities are mainly focused on the porting of a linear algebra part. These activities are very manpower demanding, are very heavy. We know that we need to do a lot of work to make this proper working. But these are the, uh, let's say, uh, the final solution. Probably not. If uh, we, we have to think what is doing on the other uh, community, we, we have to start to think of some radical solution. I mean, uh, we have to start to think to a full GPU porting. And this is a very radical idea, but that's just my my uh, my thinking and my final, let's say, uh, suggestion. Let's say we, now maybe the the yes group competitor start maybe two three years ago to this full GPU porting of the to the source code, and this is a huge effort to be done. Let's say, uh, and we are a couple steps behind them. Do we can compare with them? No, we can we can lose. We cannot compare it with the ISBO, simply. That that's my idea. What we can do, we have let's say to work to simple test cases and simple a uh, simple let's say a uh, solver, for example. So we can make a single prototype. Let's say just uh, for the moment. Uh, I think that if we have to go ahead with this activity, that can give you, give us a, a first, let's say, a speed up. We can see now the speed up is, let's say, one, two, three, four pair. Federico will show speed up of also eight, ten pair with uh, GPU chemistry. And with MGX, we have a good performance. We've seen Oak Ridge, very huge, good result by using it driven. But let's say uh, what I I let's say I would like to conclude with that uh, what we are seeing uh, in my role uh, I have to deal with all safety code in 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 industry and honestly with the, these commercial code are ready to have one order of magnitude improving performance that are already of, of the shelf. And are working very hard to get these for different uh, solver uh, uh, flow regime. What we should do, we should think to have a new radical idea to start a, a full GPU porting of one solver or one activity of one kernel. Do as a community. Maybe this is, let's say, a dream or is a, a, a full idea, but something that as a community, I think uh, we should start to think. And uh, let's say, I just uh, leave you with this uh, crazy idea and I'm over. Any questions? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. No, no. Hello, doesn't work. Uh, Tim, Tim, Tim. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ivan. Uh, uh, I was going to ask uh, that 
you know, in the latest release, we have some improvements to the linear algebra, as far as I read the release notes, some new stuff. I think what we need as a community is a bit of a guidance when to use which settings, which solvers, and, you know, things like that. Because there are already a lot of different parameters and blah, blah, blah. And now new ones are added. Uh, but I guess all of them have their kind of uh, sweet optimality spot in terms of problem size and number of cores. So I think it would be very good if uh, perhaps through the HPC committee, uh, one could kind of provide uh, some sort of, you know, a, a little bit of a user guide to the linear solvers right now, when to use what, let's say, on a very basic level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, Tim. That's a good question, and uh, it's something that we already start to think about. And just keep in mind to me what uh, we would like to do, something we have discussed with the Mark and Pass, to make some sort of a light profiling inside OpenFORM to measure how much time is spent in linear algebra solver. Because for the moment, if we are dealing only with linear algebra solver, First of all, you have to know how much time is spent in your linear algebra solver. If you make a complex geometry external area with the motor bike and so on, typically the linear algebra is 50% no more. And you cannot improve more than the 50% by the Amnar law. If you start to play with our nice and beautiful 3D driven, linear algebra is 90, 90%, and you can improve a lot. This is something that uh, maybe we, we can go uh, 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 give you some sort of uh, indication on that. Regarding the use of a linear algebra solver and acceleration, that's a, a huge, huge chapter. There are some uh, professors that spend all their life just to, to make the, the tuning of the multigrid parameter. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, 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 another, another, let's say, course. Maybe we can. Uh, you, what we can do by we can categorize by different let's say type of uh, problem incompressible by size and so on this can be done let's say honestly yeah this, when you can use a gang maybe maybe seven or uh, as can give you uh, yeah thanks seven yeah gregor uh, uh, Go down, guys, please. <laughs> please, Gregor. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm yeah, totally in favor of a radical approach. So, um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm sorry, cannot change that. But I'm getting older, so, the, so I'm catching up probably. But. Um, but I want, but I wanted to stress, and really wanted to say, is that we should uh, organize that as a community in a way such that we are not locked into just one solution. So I talked to Henrik like uh, two days ago, and I think we should have some kind of API where one, like how we can change uh, different MPI uh, versions in open form. We should have a way to use different numerical backends to for example, offload uh, a matrix assembly and not to rely on just a single vendor because right now it might be NVIDIA, but what happens if NVIDIA doesn't uh, change their uh, focus a bit, then we would be locked into NVIDIA. So, yeah. And I would say we have to think about how to organize it in a way such that we like, all come together and can contribute. Okay, thanks for the question. The, the people we have to talk with are Simone that is not here, Stefan that is here, and Mark that is here. But see for form was a uh, was thing at the beginning to be a general framework. It is still a general framework you can use. Talk with you, you can you can plug in your Ginkgo inside Stefano. It's not Stefano, it, it's a well, Stefano. Well, 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 no, uh, so the whole point of having Petsy as an entry point is that, you know, being a general purpose library is highly, mm, uh, is, is very likely that someone else will contribute code to Petsy, right? And you can benefit out of the contribution of others. So if you, for example, want to contribute the Ginkgo in, uh, interface to Petsy, all the Petsy users, including OpenFOAM, 
will benefit. So we the 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 way that the interface to the to the matrix assembly has been done is completely generic and uses the fastest assembly routines that we we can design. And it, it proved to be fast for for uh, GPU assembly, and um, and it's fastest also for assembly hybrid stuff, as I will show you later. Uh, let me introduce the next speaker. The next speaker is uh, Boyd Wilson, who is talking about uh, expanding a cloudy cluster to meet the needs of the open from community. Please. Thank you. I don't. It. I just. I just opened it. I haven't changed it since I opened it, so it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. So it's. Yeah. But thank you. <laughs> thank you. Can I hear myself? Yes. Yeah, you can. Unless everything disappears. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so I'm going to go very rapidly. I have 20 pounds of flour for now a five pound bag. Um, so I just want to tell a little bit about um, our company, Omnibond. We are a spinoff of Clemson University, so we're very academically focused. We do a lot of work um, in high performance computing. Actually, the leadership team has had quite a bit of high performance computing from NCSA to Purdue to Clemson. And so we have a lot of history building and I ran data centers and former lives and things like that. And we work with communities and software. Um, we have three major <clears throat> software areas that we cover, identity and security management. We do computer vision and AI with for the transportation industry. And we also do cloud, HPC, and parallel storage. We are the maintainers of Orange FS, upstream of the Linux kernel, and the new work on version three that's making really good progress. It's taken about like a decade to work on. Um, and we go the extra mile. This is a little bit about our, I'll leave this slide, people can look at it in there. That's a little bit of what we do with computer vision. One of the things we've done with Cloudy Cluster, which is our historical product for Cloud HPC, is we've done some interesting scaling results. And this is really scaling of the mechanism because this is high throughput. This isn't LinPack, this isn't NPI, but this is just the mechanics of getting that scaling. So we did an interesting project with NLP, with Clemson University. Um, it was an economics problem, looking at all the papers across forever. <laughs> and we did 1.1 million vCPUs and EC2 spot instances, and we were able to scale it, do a nice, nice pull a lot of data set that they're still plowing through. Google wanted to follow up, so we actually took our traffic vision product, made it, and we wanted to do some simulations for urgent HPC. We wanted to see how fast and rapid can you take camera streams for the southeast that gets hurricanes, southeast US, that gets hurricanes a lot. If we took the camera video streams, can we do real-time processing of all of those and get real meaningful data to feed back and also feed into simulations in the future? So that was another very interesting project. And that's about you know, 6 million vCPU hours and we processed like 2.5 million hours of video. So pretty interesting. Um, our classic architecture has been specific cloud-based. You could take Cloudy Cluster and you can launch it in Google Cloud or you can launch it at AWS. It's in the marketplaces of each of those. And you can have an HPC cluster in just a matter of minutes, the time it takes to spin up. And we have a, then there's the, AWS architecture, there's the GCP architecture. And then one of the interesting things about Cloudy Cluster is the Metascheduler approach. We went with an approach where we have the Metascheduler that runs in front of Torque or Slurm, which you can choose. And then when you launch jobs, it dynamically spins up the nodes you need, puts them in placement policies, lets you choose the networking, all those things, and then tears it down when the job's done. Um, so it's kind of historically, we've had a lot of success. People like this model. We're going to extend on it. And this is a video you can look at. This is kind of using OpenFoam. We ship OpenFoam actually as part of the image. Yeah, 
I'm worried about time. <laughs> um, so this is, you know, running a small little dam break fine job. Um, but I'm not going to go through that. I have to click over here to go to the next slide. There we go. Um, this is what an example job looks at. We'll, we'll be sharing the slides. So your normal NS bash for your, you know, slurm jobs. Interesting thing is GCPIT to specify instance type. Um, it's AWS IT. I forgot to put that in there for AWS. So that way you can have a job that you can take from on-prem to either cloud and the job script doesn't have to change. So it was kind of the, the goal and the goal going forward. And you want spot preemptible. There's your options there. But we did it with the meta sketcher. So it's all in the job script. So it goes with you, remembers it with all the other work you have that's compiled there together. So you don't have to think about this stuff separately. So now, this year we've started developing and work with a few universities and partners, um, Project Eureka, which is kind of the next evolution of this concept. And one of the things that we've learned, um, and I'll talk about in a second, is the need for interactive workloads in addition to compute, in addition to storage. And how do you integrate all these things in an HPC environment so you don't have to deal with them all separately? You know, compute thinks about storage when you get to the mount point. You got to worry about storage otherwise separately. And it, it, it's, you know, it needs to be simpler. I want to get to the demo. So we're going to slide through that. The other thing that we've learned from a lot of discussions is people really want project focus. They want to be able to create a project, have the data for that project, have the collaborators for that project all brought together, and then be able to do interactive and really high performance computing. And they want to do that as easy as possible. And again, we're leveraging a lot from the open source community. We have IRODS, which is a partner of or a member of the consortium, because we want to look at data management. This needs to be part of that. You need to, if you need a large data set over here to compute, you might need to stage it. You might need to do other things like that. Um, constellation driven Terraforms. So we're actually leveraging Terraform, but we're using it programmatically to be able to go portability cross cloud and even on-prem. And then the Omni scheduler is the core. It's kind of the evolution of the meta scheduler, which will allow us to do some of these other capabilities. I don't know how many people are familiar with Open On Demand? Just a couple. Okay, so we work closely with the Ohio State Supercomputing Center, who's the lead developer of Open On Demand, which is an open source HPC web UI. And it's used, you see all those red dots all over the place. And we were actually doing some work with this to make that even easier, but we do a, a really good collaboration with them as well. This is the reason the Open On Demand is used at a couple of places. Um, here's their model. One of the biggest things that's an advantage to it is its security model. Everything inside is run as the user. If you have questions about that, I, I'm happy to tell you about that later. IRODS, data management. And these are the people that are actually members of the consortium. I asked them at the last meeting, can I get a list of users, not just the consortium members? but quite a few people are leveraging this across industries to manage data. So here's kind of the heart of Eureka. So we have the Eureka UI, which is project-based. We have, it's built on open on demand. We have the Omni scheduler constellation, which the Omni scheduler is kind of the brains. It'll actually instantiate interactive and HPC apps. It'll, it talks to constellation, which deals with, TerraSpace and Terraform to actually deploy and you know, deprovision all of the, the resources. So it's all maintained, all using standard industry tools. And then IRODS again for the data management to move between compute needs and different storage needs. <laughs> and some of the, the concepts that you can get out of this is you know, if, if you get down the job directives, again, if you remember like the job directives for things, imagine job directives that allow you to say, I want to stage this data to this place before I compute. And then I want to stage these results over here, just job directives. So that, that's where we're headed with this. What if we want to provision other things? We want to provision a Kubernetes cluster. 
But if you want to provision these other things, this should all be driven by that same thing with the Terraform model and through our in instantiation of that, we can do that. We have these higher level constructs and then we do that. And then if you want to stage data, tier data based on different principles, you can set that all up. And we're going to try to provide that as easy as possible out of the UI. And then you can do things like replicate, archive, ingest, tier, publish, all kind of tied into that. So there's the architecture. And the one thing before I get to the demo, which I'm going to be really quick, is we want to enable routing between different clouds. So if I want a job to run over there, I can route data and compute to a different cloud. So it's not, I'm looking at this cloud. I'm looking at this cloud. No, it's I'm looking at my compute resources. It's taking a different approach to it. If I want on-prem, you can instantiate. We have so many people coming to us and say, hey, can you do this cloudy cluster stuff on my on-prem cluster? Well, we're going to try to do that. We're going to interface with KVM and try to do as much as we can. And here, let's demo. That'll get us back on time. <laughs> Sorry, I need glasses for this. So real quick, this is the user interface. This is an app that we've developed and we're going to open source um, that's on top of um, open on demand. And it's very easily, you know, you have the ability to, so I only have one project in here, but I can create a new project. Project owners can do things. You can put collaborator emails in there. We won't go through all that because I type too slow. You go into a project and then you have these launchers and launchers are pre-configured applications that give you the ability, we'll add a launcher just so we can see what that looks like. You select an application, these are pre-configured applications inside, and then you give the launcher a name, and then you choose the instance type, or if you want a GPU, you choose a GPU instance type, and then you go ahead and you say add. We're not gonna add because we already have some running. And so up here I have, you, know, you just say connect, and it will dynamically connect to it. Um, and then, so right now I have an open phone one up here and I was gonna do something a little more fancy than the typical, but this is all running in a browser and the, the, it, the hotel Wi-Fi gave me nothing but fits yesterday, but there it is. I'm, I'm doing this in a web browser that I've never seen before today, walked in, logged in, used it. I'm doing open phone and it's ready to go. And, that, and that's the power of open on demand. And we're just leveraging that under this, this interface. This is this this is running in its its own instance node in AWS. Yeah, this is all this this is all remote. I, I did the data there. I, I'm doing the visualization. It's all remote in a web browser that I've never seen before. And Oh, I'm going to close these real quick. But you can also do things like VS Code Server. And I don't know how to switch tabs without, I'm going to do that. You can have RStudio. You know, you can have many other things up and running. And they're all their own different instance in the cloud. You can set the size of those. So you can have four different simulations running at the same time, doing the visualization, looking at it, they're all tabs in your browser. And one other thing, because I know I'm out of time click on the right button, you actually have the ability in here is this is a, a storage manager. And, and this is like early alpha code. So I, I didn't mention that already. This is not, this is like, okay, let's go give a demo and do it in alpha. Um, but this is a user interface that's all interacting with IRODs, which is a metadata management that allows you to, um, you know, work with, <laughs> you know, whatever storage system you want. Now, the cool thing about iRODs is I'm going to go down here and show one slide. So you saw the file manager. In the future, iRODs has the ability to integrate with multiple file systems. So what we're going to be able to do from this is you're going to be able to create an S3 bucket for this project, for these collaborators, and you have an S3 bucket. You might have a GCS bucket too that's over here. It's project-based. You're not tied to a cloud. You can do that. And then you're going to be able to move data 
stage data or set up rules to do that data between any of these locations, or you can send those data to and from jobs. And I think I'm way out of time, but thank you. Thanks for your presentation. Any questions? Yes, Eugene. Uh, Yeah. So because we're leveraging a lot of open source software, single cloud installation of this, we're looking to make it free. So if you want to use this in a single cloud, it's free and easy. If you want to do things like job routing, if you want, you know, I want budgets in those types of things and pricing, those will be, it's kind of a freemium model. But because we're using so much open source, we want people just to use it, make their lives better. The base is going to be free. And then we're still figuring those other things out. But our current cloudy cluster model is based on pricing in the marketplace, based on how much you use. Our pricing is going to be more, we're going to have some options to make it easier, institutional level, but also per engineer type levels and things like that. So we, we can figure those things out. But we're going to try to be very flexible. We want a base level because we're using, and, and we contribute back, obviously, to the open source, but we want to make it so everybody has something that's better than what's out there now. Okay. Let me introduce... Uh... Next speaker uh, with uh, Sun Pose from NVIDIA that is going to uh, talk about open form solver development for GPUs and ARM GPUs. Please, Sun, stage. Yvonne, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for this opportunity. And uh, my role in NVIDIA is program management of the CFD domain. And I come from a mechanical engineering background as a CFT practitioner, not necessarily on the computer science side. So I'm gonna talk about more of the user aspects of what we're doing and give you updates of what um, Ivan had introduced. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Open Foam collaboration, why it matters to NVIDIA, and then the latest on our CPU and uh, GPU and CPU development. NVIDIA now is a CPU company if you hadn't heard the announcement. So, all right, real quick on the motivation. Uh, Open Foam is the most widely used non-commercial CFD software. We all know that. We get uh, countless requests from customers to have that available, uh, but we use it ourselves in our own designs. And then lately we're working on projects in deep learning where we're applying Open Foam to parameterize geometries and run large HP, large scale HPC problems that we can then use to train a surrogate model. More about that uh, in the next conference perhaps. As Ivan had pointed out, GPU enabling is one of the top priorities. Really, this external solver capability that exists is what got us to the point where we're at today, and I'll talk about that. And again, the very important development that was done with the uh, Price white paper. And then the opportunity we had here was to leverage a decade of GPU efforts we've been watching. I'm going to show you the list here in a moment that uh, had various levels of success, but none of them were really participations by organizations like OpenCFD, they didn't have much success, but there were some quality implementations that were able now to go and leverage some of that work. Here's that decade of open phone thrust. I, I have 13 that I investigated to try and pick some direction of how we should go. I'm not gonna go into detail here, but you can see they all had really early versions on the implementation. The, the split really happened around version three. And uh, again, these just weren't able to succeed because you didn't have buy-in from the community. And I'll get into some of the details about what we found in that that we could then apply to our own project. Now, for some of you in the user community who aren't familiar with GPUs and how they operate, uh, they, they cannot possibly process without a CPU present. And uh, you start and end an open foam job on the CPU. You don't really notice the GPU interaction here. But it all happens, the data transfers over this interconnect. And that's really important in the design. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, later in this, in, in the motivation for why we developed a CPU. But uh, just to give you some baseline here. And our implementation is the offload model that I just hinted at, and I'll give you more detail about that, but where we're really just focused on solving the linear system. And that means that a good proportion of the code, and these are just rough schematics depending on your particular problem. In fact, we're not seeing that 65%. That's a very favorable profile, if you can get it, it's not really the case in a lot of the applications we're looking at, but that's the only part of the code we're accelerating. So keep that in mind as we go forward too. The other 35% sits on the CPUs as a hybrid arrangement like you saw earlier. Now, 
the decade of GPU efforts, like I said, there was some quality in there and we learned from that and we're able to pull from it. But because you don't have the full 100% of the computation on the GPU, you're limited by Amdahl's law at how much speed up you can see. Uh, two of the implementations did include putting non-solver parts of the code on there and they, they showed some good performance. Uh, there was no real involvement from OpenCFD, for example, or other organizations. And it's probably why it didn't advance much beyond the version two releases. And then several used NVIDIA libraries, which we uh, were able to understand better uh, since we developed those and were able to implement some that uh, included, and we chose a path towards the AMGX, which you heard about, which is a very active development in NVIDIA currently. The collaboration involves a number of organizations. Um, we've got OpenCFD here in, in, our, in the room today, uh, people like uh, Matthias and um, what Mark has contributed. Uh, Ivan had mentioned Chineka, Simone. Ivan had started with us when he was at Chineka, now or Leonardo. And these are the two gentlemen at NVIDIA involved in this, uh, helping in the development side. But there's others involved, and in, um, they include also customer contributions and, and members of the HPC TC. Now, for the solution, if you're not familiar with it, Again, we start with uh, standard open phone because we're not making any changes to the source code here. We're using the external solver capability that came out of the Price White Paper. Uh, that was the Petsy for phone development that came from that. Everything you see in blue is running on CPU. We wrote this interface called Foam to CSR where we had to take the ID ILU format and convert that to a CSR format, which is what a matrix format our particular solver library prefers, the AMGX. Uh, that also does some things like handling coordination of moving the data from the CPU to the GPU, the uh, PCI Express that I mentioned, that, that interconnect between CPU and GPU. It does the um, dispatching of the linear systems to the AMGX. AMGX is entirely on the GPU and doing the linear solves, bringing the solution vector back to the CPU uh, where it completes, like I described earlier, with, with no user intervention. There's a number of different softwares you would need to download. I just described that here. If you're interested to test it yourself, it's, it's available. We've had several test this without involvement of NVIDIA. We've worked with others and we can work with you if you're interested in uh, trying it yourself, depending on your application. Uh, and here's some early results we got with our A100. Now that's the previous generation, but it's probably the most familiar, familiar because the H100 has just started to ship. I'm gonna talk about that as kind of the future topic. But to give you kind of a baseline of the A100, this is what you would typically observe with, um, and, and this is, it's, it's really a misplaced that we don't have good benchmarks that we've applied to this yet. That's something we're working to change, but the 3D lid driven cavity, it has a very nice favorable profile, but it doesn't really lend itself to user applications in a way that you might expect. It's even laminar, not even turbulent. And then the motor bag case, has a profile where the time spent in the linear solver is in the 30% range, depending on your linear solver choice, whether it's the DIC or the GAMG. So they're not very favorable profiles for accelerating on GPU. And that's why I show you here, just the speed ups for the linear solver portion. So this is the part of the computation we can actually accelerate. And you can see speed ups where we get to uh, factors of four for our library over what's possible on uh, CPUs, okay? Now, when you go to overall speedups where you've got end to end, which is what you really care about as a practitioner, you can see they're much more modest speedups. Again, they have to do with the profile and how much time you're actually going to be able to accelerate. So this is the early work. Um, I thought we did reasonably well. We're seeing some improvements now with the next generation. I'm gonna talk about that as we go forward. Uh, quickly though, for those who really are concerned about validation, which we all should be, of course, Oak Ridge did a really nice study on Summit where they validated everything we were doing numerically. This is based on a V100 system at Oak Ridge, if you're familiar with it. They still applied the standard benchmark case of the lid-driven cavity, but we're able to get some validation that matched uh, exactly as it should, and then showed some strong scaling results where they took the model and were able to go as high as 216 million cells for the lid-driven cavity, and then scale that on eight nodes of Summit, which has 48 GPUs total, and got a 150x speed up. And this work was presented at a workshop that's available if you guys are interested. There's a lot more to it. I'm just showing you a couple of highlights and I'll be able to share it with you if you'd like. And since then, um, Dr. Badalasi has joined the HPC TC 
and represents, I guess, nuclear energy for the TC and is someone available to describe this work as well. All right, so um, I'm going to pause there and start talking about what's going forward with our latest GPU and the ARM CPU development. Now, if you've been following the progression of GPU architectures over time, these are released every three years or so. And uh, V100, I talked about, that was the Oak Ridge system. Most people are familiar with the A100 because that's what's available in most systems today. And the H100 was recently announced and just starting to ship. And you can see the progression, you know, factors of performance that has, has been available in these new systems with modest increases in uh, power and um, interconnect speeds. Again, we're kind of limited on, on what's available with the PCIe. We've got our other interconnect technology, but the performance between the CPU and the GPU really matters. And we'll talk about that for a bit, but also want to point out that there's specific features here in the GPU that would matter to you depending on your interest. So for second order CFD, like standard open foam, you've seen now we're up to uh, three terabytes per second on uh, memory bandwidth. So you want to try and get as much of that memory bandwidth as possible out of your computation, um, which is not always with sparse matrix vector operations, an easy task, but that's that's really the, the goal here. Now, we're also seeing a trend towards the high order community where they're seeing an opportunity now to take the so-called deep learning hardware. I've heard that expression. We heard that this morning from Neil. I don't know if he's in the room, but you know we are kind of beholden to the vendors who are developing hardware towards certain markets that are driving most of their revenue. It's, historically, it's been that way. It's not been scientific computing has always followed what the, the business drivers are. Now it's deep learning. You've got an opportunity now with high order codes and converting that uh, sparse matrix vector operation into a matrix matrix multiply. We're seeing a, a, a lot of uh, commercial development even in that area uh, where LES is of interest. And then now there's also a number of AI based uh, CPU uh, CFD solvers that are starting to develop. Uh, some of the startups that were mentioned this morning in, in Neil's talk are, are examples of that, where they're combining numerical and AI models. And we've got an architecture, I think, that's pretty well balanced for these different approaches to the problem. Now, what's really new and unexpected from NVIDIA, though, is because we had that bottleneck with the PCIe interface to an x86, and I think we lost uh, some sort of... Um, time period where it could not be modified to a certain level that the x86 vendors may have wanted to to be more competitive, we went and developed our own interface to our own CPU based on the ARM architecture and have licensed that now. Uh, it's available and starting to ship in Q3, I believe. One of the uh, key systems we have here, I'll, I'll talk about a few that have been uh, installed. But I see my colleagues from Calst, where they all have a large system. There'll be a few others. I'll show you a list. But what's really important here is you've got now uh, what was, sorry, let me jump back. Uh, PG, sorry, PCI Gen 5, 128 gigabytes per second on data transfer. You now have this uh, 900, almost a terabyte per second in data transfer. That's faster than the memory bandwidth on the CPU. So Essentially, you've eliminated transfer costs is the benefit there. Uh, but what we have now is this high-speed CPU connected to the new H100. You've got 144 ARM V9 cores. This is an HPC ARM, not one that you would find in your, your handphone. And memory bandwidth, that's at 500 megabytes per second with uh, 480 gigabytes of memory. That's uh, this LP for low power DDR. So you have also power efficiency benefits that come with this type of architecture. That was really the goal here for us to eliminate that slow interface between CPU and GPU and get to something very low power, which has a roadmap that to us looks much more favorable than what's possible in the power envelope that's available in the x86. It's our motivation. Uh, the NV link is proprietary. That's what gives us the fast interconnect. And then um, again, power efficiency improvements that come with this. Uh, sorry, I should have mentioned. So we have the CPU, GPU interconnect. Later we announced we're just going with a node that's CPU only, okay? Because not everyone is favorable to having GPU computing yet. Maybe some of their software runs on GPUs, other doesn't. Uh, they want an environment, they might want to mix nodes where some nodes are pure CPU only, some are CPU, GPU. So we have that option now with the 
a Grace uh, ARM only node. Uh, just to give you a quick example on some of the benefits again, in a typical arrangement with x86 where you've got perhaps four GPUs, and this is a, a kind of configuration we have available. You can see it's uh, two terabytes in 30 seconds for your transfer rates, where you're looking at uh, factor 30, two terabytes in one second by this, again, high-speed interface that we have between CPU and GPU. Again, one of the really key benefits for us. Now, systems have been announced on this new CPU, GPU architecture. The Grace Hopper uh, is the, the name of the system, but the uh, it's, it's an ARM-based CPU along with uh, the H100 GPU. We've got uh, some very important systems around the world. I mentioned uh, KAUST, Shaheen 3, that was announced recently. Uh, the CSCS system in the um, Switzerland National Supercomputing Center. I believe that will be the, Eurist, the largest available in Europe. Uh, Meyer Nostrum 5 at Barcelona Supercomputing Center is one of the HP, Euro HPC systems. There were three total. Uh, one of them is at Chineca with the Leonardo. Leonardo. And then uh, we have a large system going in at University of Bristol. There is Isambar 3 and then at the Los Alamos Laboratory in um, US. And just to give you a quick snapshot of the possibility. So the system at uh, Bristol, Isambar 3, will have over 55,000 of these uh, CPU cores. It's a pure CPU only system that they, they're going to install. And they've been a really um, good partner with certain applications that include Open Phone. Uh, Simon McIntosh Smith, if you know him and his group. And actually his student, okay, Matt Martin though, what, he did his PhD with Simon. So he, he was part of this. All right, so I'm gonna spend a little time on this because it's kind of a lot going on here, but this is what you can expect with the new CPU and the new GPU, the kind of benefits. So this is your typical arrangement on a x86 processor. In this case, we ran a test on a Milan 64 core. You've got this amount of solver. This is based on the HPC motor bike case, 34 million cells. Um, I think 30% was a solver, it's a schematic. I don't think I have the actual um, to scale here, but schematically what happens is you've got this amount that we can accelerate is somewhere in the factor of eight that you could accelerate, uh, speed up this amount of code, it becomes that portion. But you see in this orange here, you've added some overhead related to the data transfer. This is when you're running on an x86 plus the new GPU. So yeah, the GPU can accelerate this, this portion of the code to that level that you see, but you've added cost from data transfer. Well, what happens then, and overall, we still get like a 1.7x speed up with our new H100. And that's an improvement over 1.3, I believe, for the A100. But then as we go to this, uh, replace the x86 with an ARM CPU, you're, you're still seeing the solver time. That doesn't change. It's the same GPU, same operations on the GPU. But you've sped up the computation by having a faster CPU. In the case of the Grace ARM, it's faster than the Milan. That wouldn't be true for Genoa. I'm going to show you a plot next on CPU only results. Okay. This is what we had in our lab and this is what we ran. Um, and then you can see now we've eliminated all of the PCA, PCIe data transfer cost. It's, it's, it's gone because the fast interconnect is faster than the, than the cost of that transfer. And we've got an overall speed up of 3.2. And there were no code changes going from the x86 to the ARM. Uh, that's just a straight recompile of any code that's in an x86 environment can compile on ARM. So the benefit comes from the hardware side. Okay. I'm not sure if I explained that well, but okay. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, the question is, did we recompile the code? Yes, we had to recompile the x86 code for the ARM architecture, but there were no code changes. You might change some compiler flags for ARM, but you should not see any code changes. That would be very unusual. So, and this represents our results for CPU only. Now here we included the very latest AMD. Now our, our product is based on AMD uh, Milan. This is why I showed that earlier. But here we're running just the best CPUs that are available today. So you've got the uh, Grace again, Sapphire Rapids from Intel, and then the Genoa. And you can see the kind of results are that 
uh, we're a little bit faster than what's possible on Genoa, but the power envelope is about 2x. And so the story for here is that you're getting much more power efficiency. Now, that may not matter to you as an end user practitioner. It matters more to your IT department. But that could be motivation for why these start showing up in your data center. Uh, but you'll have access to this. There's a lot of details about how it was compiled, what options are required. Again, very straightforward. We didn't really do any compiler optimization, I would say, just a straight compile of what was possible and uh, use the best solver options that were available. So GAMG for pressure, smooth solver you can see for momentum and the uh, turbulence. Ran 100 iterations, very classic benchmark. And you could go and recreate this, maybe replicate the results we had with the information we provided. All right. So uh, there's more about our architectures on our website. And then what we're really getting, trying to get to is some kind of a release that's supported. And Ivan, you had pointed or um, hinted at this. And we do now finally have some GPUs in at ESI where they're doing tests and uh, perhaps some even further optimizations that we haven't considered. But um, we're continuing to push on this library, which is our current approach. And from that, OpenCFD will naturally benefit from the roadmap of that library because it just plugs in. There's no changes that are required. And that's a very active development because of a number of codes that use it. But I would say OpenFoam is probably the most important to us in that development. Um, we've got to get to a better set of benchmarks. I think drive error was one that we'd like to target. The, the motorbike, we need, we need something with a more favorable profile to GPUs. It doesn't make sense to accelerate something that's only 30% of your computation. It really doesn't gain you much. So we're talking to uh, Neil Ashton about that. He's got access to that case that he showed this morning in his talk. He wants to eventually propose some kind of a large scale F1 geometry on the AWS service. Uh, we're open to that. We're not ready for it, but that's on our, our list. And then we're going to continue this collaboration that's developed and expand that as we need, right? Uh, we've got to do more with the non-solver parts of the code. That's what's coming out of the PolyMe developments that Ivan talked about. There's other opportunities there, such as uh, standard parallel constructs in the code. And then where we'll have the Grace ARM support, Fred has committed to a ARM release of this when we get ready. And then, uh, like, like I said, we have GPUs now installed in the Bracknell Center that they're starting to work with. Uh, so just in summary, um, we're expanding the collaboration, making it as open as possible. We invite you to work with us. We've already started working with organizations like Oak Ridge, General Motors, VW. They've all had evaluations at different levels of success. Uh, actually, the Sorry, the collaboration has expanded a bit to include AWS, where we're getting some guidance on the CSP side. We see some opportunity there. They're already a very large customer, as you heard about in the talk today. And then our current approach is to make absolutely no changes to the current open foam distribution, but we've got to do more and get the non-solver under the code if we're going to make this a meaningful release. And uh, I showed you some of the speed ups that are possible. You could try and replicate some of these if you like, and we'll be happy to work with you if it, if it uh, helps you get past any difficulties you might have with the current implementation. But hopefully we'll get to something that's a bit more um, just standard compile and run that you're accustomed to on the CPU side uh, with the solution. So um, uh, thank you for the opportunity and I'll answer any questions, please. Thank you, Son, for a very nice uh, talk. Just a uh, comment regarding the benchmark. Of course, you need a more realistic and asset test case to prove your. I think you can benefit for the work done by Henrik. Now, on the technical committee level, there is a lot of new industrial test cases, and you can start to look into it. This is real industrial test cases. Uh, Gre Gregor? A uh, lot of people, uh, yes, uh, if you go back, guys, please.
So is it, so the question is specifically about HBM memory versus DD? Well, certainly they're all heading in that direction, but then we're also all watching the memory vendors and, and what they decide because we all have the same suppliers more or less. And you've got to make certain investments in memory depending on the roadmap that you have in mind. But I would say you're going to see more HBM implementations than DDR. Now, our particular case, that was an LP DDR. Um, we weren't ready for HBM on the CPU side because some of the economic factors that came up at the time. But I, I think you're going to see more of that. It's certainly a standard for GPUs, HBM. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's right. I can just uh, comment on that. Uh, let's say open form as a CFD God is memory bounded. As long as you increase the, the, the memory of your CPU, you have a lot of speed up. Other vendors are increasing a lot the, the, the memory of the CPU. And this is going to give you a huge performance increase. So let's say, and this is all another aspect. Let's say we are talking about the GPU development, but still, if you see, if we say on CPU, which is this new CPU, but other vendor, there is a huge uh, performance improvement by only memory bandwidth because they are double also uh, increasing more than double the memory bandwidth of the new CPU. And this is something that you can benefit as well, okay? By by not touching at all the code, simply the compiling, okay? The question was specifically about the uh, operations. Oh, right, sorry. Right. Yes, the question was about the non-solver parts of the code are referenced, which is primarily matrix construction and, and assembly. There can be a significant amount of time spent there. In fact, more than the linear solver we found with the motorbike case. Embarrassingly parallel, Henrik might know that, but that would surprise me. Um, but I will say that we have a project going with PolyMe, and that talk is here tomorrow. There's some work being done there. I can say that NVIDIA and ourselves, we haven't done it for two reasons. One is it, the code is GPL, and we can't work on GPL for legal reasons. This is not just NVIDIA, that's all vendors. Uh, and then the other was, it's not clear that it'll be accepted by the open foam community. You make the investment and, you know, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's, it needs to be accepted into the code base. So there's still, we think the approach is hybrid right now. Our strategy is hybrid, have a very fast CPU to handle that, uh, remove that bottleneck between CPU and GPU. And you should see some incremental benefit is, of course, it's not, the same as having everything on the GPU, but we'll see benefit from that, as you saw in that diagram, going from the 1.7 to the 3.2. So our strategy right now is the hardware side versus further development. And we're still uh, not making changes to open foam in the current strategy, but something needs to be done. You're right. Well, for us, I, and I've talked to Henrik, we would need a change in the matrix format, we'd prefer a more modern CSR format, which doesn't exist today, which could require lots of memory management changes. It's, it's just a lot more than embarrassingly parallel, I, I would guess. I, you, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Mark's observation was that CSR may not be the right horse to write. It's it's what we have available in our AMGX, which is why. But there seems to be a little overhead in our matrix conversion at the moment. Yeah. So Mark Olson knows that part of the problem well and a reference you should check with. Bye -bye, uh, tomorrow or later on, we have a presentation by Chineka with a new matrix format, the data structure. 
so we can see later on, okay? Is no? Okay. Okay, there is there is Okay, there is there is some going or some work on going on the extra form for new data structure. Is under investigation extra form. It's not present today, but it's is ongoing the work, okay? There was another Eric, do you have a question? 